Good morning. This is Rosa, Spanish interpreter. Uh, good morning. This is Victor, Spanish interpreter. Good morning, Rosie and Victor. I'm going to bring in the rest of our team. Okay, perfect. Thank you. awareness. All right, next slide. So we're going to do the question and answer portion a little bit differently for this meeting um, and utilize the raise hand feature. I don't know, Chris, if you had a different idea of um, how you wanted things to run, but near the bottom of the screen, you can use the raise hand feature and we will work through everyone's questions at, uh, at the end of the 20 minute staff presentation. All right, now I'll hand it over to the rest of the team to kick off today's presentation. Thanks again for joining us. Thanks, Laura. Uh, so good morning, everybody. And, and like Laura said, welcome. Uh, we appreciate you all taking time out of your Saturday morning to listen in on the Housing Hillsboro Project. And we hope to share uh, information with you as well as answer any questions that you may have. So we're going to go through project overview uh, what middle housing is, and then touch on our schedule and community engagement for this project. So our staff and consulting team that are here this morning uh, is Colin Cooper, who's the planning director, myself, uh, development services manager. My name is Chris Berry. And then also uh, Leslie Hamilton, who's the senior planner on development services, Rachel Marble, who's a planner on development services, and Laura Combs, who's a planner with the long range team. So uh, the planning division here at the city of Hillsborough is broken into three different sections, one being administration. And then there's the long range team that Laura is a part of uh, that facilitates the, the long range vision uh, for the city. And then Rachel, Leslie and myself are on development services, uh, which would be considered current planning. So implementation. So. And then Colin is the, the director of all three of those sections for the, the entire division. And we are all operating and, and working on this project because of the scale and scope of it, as well as the implications for long-term policy and, and current uh, implementation. Also joining us this morning are, is Kathy Corliss from Angela Planning Group. Kathy has been with the, the city as a consultant on this project uh, for over a year now and has been um, you know, wealth of knowledge as well as helping and assisting staff through uh, the many complexities of this project. So Kathy is here today. Leslie and I will handle the bulk of the presentation this morning. And then as we get into the Q&A session, it will be all of us uh, responding to the questions depending on the focus of the question and, and who might be best suited to answer. So the project goals for Housing Hillsboro, first and foremost, is to increase housing choices for all within the community. So we will touch on what that means, uh, as well as reduction of barriers for all housing, and then compliance with state legislation. So there's a lot in these three project goals that, that we'll touch on and, and try to cover the high level of them uh, through the next couple of slides. So as we look at the reduction of barriers, there is the requirement that we have from adopted state legislation that we are required to meet. But beyond that, city, the city through the planning division, but with the support of the city council and advisory committee and the planning commission, as well as a variety of other efforts are pulling into this project uh, compliance with the comprehensive plan housing policies uh, that have been in place for about four years. And those policies are an extension of the community plan, the Hillsborough 2035 community plan that was adopted over seven years ago. And combined with that, the city council has set related housing policies and priorities in 2019 through 2021. So staff is mindful and thoughtful of those policies and priorities and pulling those into this project. Also, the sheltering component of housing 
we recognize the need to update the code to meet uh, the current um, practices of sheltering. So that's also part of this project. And then we're also through this project providing minor revisions to the comprehensive plan so that the comprehensive plan and the community development code are consistent with each other relative to all of these regulations. Next slide, please. So the state legislation that is tied in with this project, the, the one piece of state legislation that is the focus for most jurisdictions through the implementation of the middle housing is House Bill 2001, which you see at the bottom of this slide. And that is the, the majority of the work that is being done through the Housing Hillsboro project is compliance with that state legislation. But staff is also pulling in uh, these other state legislations associated with the procedures and definitions. So that House Bill 2583 is um, now prohibit cities from establishing an occupancy limit based on familiar or non-familial relationships. So uh, there has been questions in, from the previous community meeting uh, that likely will come into this meeting about what that relationship is and related to bedrooms and, and other regulations on housing units. Senate Bill two, or 1051 uh, requires cities to have clear and objective development standards to all housing. So that's um, a big shift in providing clear and objective standards rather than having standards that can be interpreted uh, with some discretion by staff or an advisory committee. So uh, that's an important component. Senate Bill 458 requires cities to allow land division, so subdivision of land um, for middle housing. And then again, House Bill 2001 is the middle housing legislation and Leslie's gonna touch on what middle housing is uh, in a couple of slides. Additional state legislation related to affordable housing and sheltering are, are these three um, House bills and Senate bills um, that require cities to allow affordable housing projects by nonprofit corporations, uh, as well as uh, requiring cities to allow affordable housing in any zone except heavy industrial uh, without requiring uh, zone changes or conditional use permits, which have been somewhat standard uh, for affordable housing projects. And then House Bill 3261 requires cities to allow the conversion of motels and hotels to emergency shelters, uh, as well as the conversion of those to affordable housing uh, with um, you know, specific reasonable regulations. So I'm gonna turn it over to Leslie and she's gonna run through uh, the next part of the presentation, thanks. Thanks, Chris. Uh, my name is Leslie Hamilton. I'm a senior planner with Development Services. Um, and my part of the presentation, I'm really going to focus on middle housing, and that's the bulk of uh, the efforts in, in this middle housing. Uh, Hillsboro's effort to comply with House Bill uh, 2001. Uh, middle housing, this is a graphic that you might have seen um, you know, on our website, on other cities' websites as well. But it's a very simplified graphic uh, showing what what middle housing is, and those are in the green shaded uh, middle portion of the graphic. It includes cottage clusters, duplexes, townhomes, triplex, and quadplex. Uh, and the idea with middle housing is that these uh, options are all available in zones which previously allowed uh, just single family detached dwellings. It is a simplified version. You know, not all quadplexes are gonna look stacked like that, not all triplexes. And, and not all cottage clusters look exactly like that. So a very simplified version. Um, as I mentioned, middle housing types will now be permitted in all zones where detached single family dwellings were previously permitted. Uh, there will be siting and design standards uh, that are crafted specifically to these middle housing types and single family dwellings as well. And those are gonna include things like parking, uh, parking design, uh, orientation of cottages and front doors, and design details such as uh, front doors and articulation and windows. Um, cottage clusters, I'm gonna get into, get into in a little more detail uh, later on in my presentation. Uh, next slide, please. 
Uh, and this is a map of uh, Hillsborough, and it shows the zones that middle housing will be affected by, or th that will affect uh, these zones. There are 13 zones in particular. Uh, the single family zones or the uh, single family and multifamily residential are shown in the lighter orange. And uh, there's some ap applicable mixed use zones, three in particular that are shown in the uh, darker orange there. As you can see, it's, it's a good part of the city, uh, probably looks like about 50% of that. Um, but it, it is touching a lot of zones and a lot of opportunity within uh, the city of Hillsborough. Next slide, please. Uh, what are cottage clusters? So this is a new housing type, um, I think for a lot of cities. Uh, what it means is a housing type with three or more detached units oriented around a courtyard or common area. Um, to meet the state's definition, a cottage cluster, for a cottage cluster, each cottage must have a building footprint of less than 900 square feet, and that excludes 200 feet of garage, and the development must have a density of at least four units per acre. Um, so I think Sorry, muted for his sec. So uh, yeah, new definition for um, for Hillsborough and for all the cities, most likely. And uh, there's some very specific standards for cottage clusters that are proposed uh, in the Housing Hillsborough Code. Next slide, please. Uh, some of the big questions that have come up uh, in Housing Hillsborough so far are how will this affect density? Um, the mi minimum and maximum densities in each zone will not change, so each zone has a uh, identified range going from low density to middle density to high density, those will not change, um, but maximum densities will not apply to most middle housing types or will have higher allowances. Uh, and that in, that uh, includes both townhomes and um, cottage clusters as well. As, and as I mentioned, for all of these uh, housing types, there will be siting and design standards that apply. They will be clear and objective, uh, so that no interpretation is needed uh, to apply them and to implement them. Um, one note uh, that um, it may not be feasible to add uh, dwelling units to certain properties due to constraints such as slope, natural resources, parking requirements, or limited access. So while middle housing uh, is permitted in all on all these lots, it might not be feasible. And um, it's not also not a requirement to build uh, middle housing on each lot. It is just made made as one possibility. Next slide, please. Uh, another question that comes up and or has come up is will parking be required? Uh, yes, for middle housing, one parking space will be required for each dwelling unit and that will be required to be provided on site. Uh, there are all siting and design standards. So um, where that parking is provided and what kind of landscaping and buffering, those are all uh, standards that will apply to on-site parking. There's also, you know, uh, standards for driveway spacing and that kind of, those kind of safety issues as well. Uh, quick note that for ADUs, which was a question at our last uh, community meeting, ADUs are accessory dwelling units. Uh, they were implemented in the first phase of Housing Hillsboro. Uh, so they are a clear and objective standard or path to uh, allow an ADU, which is an accessory dwelling unit in, in most uh, residential zones. They are slightly different from middle housing. Uh, one of the big differences is parking. And uh, for ADUs, which is one unit, uh, one accessory unit on a lot, uh, no additional parking is required for those types of uh, dwellings. Next slide, please. And uh, there, that's kind of faded, there we go. Okay, new procedures for middle housing, you can go to the next slide as well. Uh, so middle housing, uh, the review, it uh, does require clear and objective standards. And as Chris mentioned, what does that mean? It's, it's something measurable. Uh, it's not something that does not involve interpretation, like what is good design. It uh, identifies uh, certain measurable design elements or other uh, siting elements. Uh, so for middle housing, all uh, approval criteria do need to be clear and objective. Um, do we jump out of that presentation? We may have lost Rachel. Oh, okay. She may, I can pull it up with. Yeah. 
And Chris, um, I apologize. Did we express that we would take questions during this presentation, or are we waiting till the end? We are going to wait until the end, and okay. then we're going to elevate. Thanks for, thanks for clarifying. Yep. All right, Leslie, is that good where you were at? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Thank, thank you. Yeah, so uh, let's see where I, we were talking about clearing objective standards for middle housing. Um, and that will be uh, that review is called the zoning review. That's a new review in the code. And that review will take place concurrently with your building permit. So for any type of middle housing, uh, you submit your building permit as part of that review. Concurrently is a review of the clear and objective standards um, for um, single detached dwellings, accessory dwelling units, and middle housing developments. There are also a couple other new reviews. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail here, but middle housing land divisions are another part of state legislation um, and expedited land divisions as well. So there's a, a faster process to get through and a process that's going to apply solely to uh, land divisions that promote middle housing um, development. Um, next slide, please. And the project schedule, you can go to the next one. So here's the schedule laid out uh, and there, the, what's highlighted in orange, it might be a little hard to see, so I'll go over it, are the opportunities for public comment. And uh, we had a, a, pre, a first meeting on January 25th. This is the second community meeting, February 5th. Uh, the Housing Hillsboro uh, code amendments are proposed to go to planning commission on April 13th. And that is also an opportunity to uh, engage with the uh, decision makers and, and the public process. Uh, previous to that, there will be a number of work sessions uh, to get Planning Commission up to speed on the uh, scope and uh, the specific uh, proposed amendments as well. And then um, after Planning Commission, uh, the item goes to City Council for work sessions and readings and it is estimated that will be effective by June 14th, 2022. I want to make a note that the by state legislation, this does have to be in effect by July 1st, 2022. So uh, tight schedule there, uh, but as it's shown, shown uh, we will comply by mid-June. Next slide, please. Ne <clears throat> excuse me, next slide, please. Uh, additional questions or comments so we can uh, answer your questions uh, today. Uh, there's also an opportunity if, you know, we're, we're telling you a lot of stuff here, a lot of details. Uh, you can send emails to that uh, email in the middle, middle housing at Hillsboro oregon.gov um, that is live. I think that goes to Laura Combs. And um, uh, you can also see the Housing Hillsboro uh, presentations and other materials on the uh, project on the Housing Hills Hillsboro project page on the link at the bottom. Um, next slide, please. And now we are available for questions. Thank you. Thanks, Leslie. So uh, the way we'll handle questions today, as Laura had mentioned at the front end, is if you can raise your hand and then we will um, move you into the panelist section so you can unmute and then verbally answer your question. Slightly different than the uh, written version that we were using last time. So uh, what we would ask if anybody's elevated is if you can um, ask your question um, at a reasonable pace uh, so that our Spanish interpreters are able to interpret those questions before staff responds to them. So Laura, are you ready to elevate if people start raising their hands now? Yep, I'm ready. All right, we have the first question from MC. Hello, I, can you hear me? Yep. Okay, good. The question is, are ADUs a subset of middle housing or are they a separate um, house type for your decision about your matters such as parking or building? I'll go ahead and, and jump in there. Thank you, uh, MC. Uh, ADUs are, I think, technically not part of middle housing. Uh, they were a state-required 
uh, state requirement from a number of years ago that cities allow ADUs uh, as part of the first phase of Housing Hillsboro that we adopted, I think in 2019, uh, we did make the standards for ADUs clear and objective. Uh, so that was a, a way to perhaps see more uh, production of ADUs and make the path easier. They are slightly different in a number of ways. They uh, they do not require SDC fees, which are system development charge fees. So every dwelling unit other than ADUs has a certain fee attached to it. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, parking is not required as well for ADUs. So they, they are treated a little bit differently. Um, any, Chris or Colin, do you have anything to add on top of that? Leslie, um, you've answered the question correctly. I'll just say that the city of Hillsboro, it was Metro that back in 1996 required that Portland area metropolitan jurisdictions um, all allow ADUs as a permitted use. What we did in the first phase of housing um, Hillsboro was streamline the process significantly, which was uh, part of our response to both clear and objective standards in earlier legislation, as well as our comprehensive plan policies. Thanks. Yeah. I, do, I do want to add a couple uh, other notes on ADUs and how they differ uh, from some of the other housing types. They are limited in, in size. Max size is 750 square feet, uh, as opposed to a, a cottage cluster dwelling has a maximum of 900 square feet. So um, there are some little differences between those type of housing types. Laura, would you mind elevating MC again, just making sure that we captured uh, and responded sufficiently to her, to the question? Yeah, um, they still have permission to talk. Oh, okay. Oh, thank you. Th that was a wonderful answer. Uh, thank you very much. May I ask another question? Or sure. should I wait for others? While you're here, why don't you go ahead and ask? Okay. I'm living in a HOA, a homeowner's division. And of course, we're impacted. Um, we're, we're Hawthorne Farm Village, uh, which is nothing right now, primarily, but single family residences. And the question is the subdivision of lots. In our CCNRs, we cannot subdivide, but from my understanding, partitioning is different from subdividing. Is is do we have to change our CCNRs because it's state law? Are your are the rules that you're going to be using? Great question, MC. Kathy, would you be up for taking that one, or would you prefer that I do? Um. <laughs> Let me turn my kitty here. Yeah, Chris, if you've got a good answer, because I need to actually I was good thinking I needed to uh, look at that a little bit more carefully before answering since it's a legal question. And of course, uh, I'm not a lawyer. So um, I hesitate to give you any any legal advice on something like that and see um, it might be something that we could do a little research on and follow up so that we're accurate in our answer um, with regard to how it might affect your uh, CCNRs. Um, I think that, uh, Chris, unless you've got it, you've got the answer at the touch of your fingertips, I feel like I need to do some research. And yeah, Colin, maybe if you can help me out here, but the uh, state legislation uh, is not mandating that existing HOAs go and revise CCNRs. Um, the state legislation prohibits future CCNRs. So those are um, covenants and restrictions for uh, those that might not know that acronym that associations have. And uh, there are uh, plenty of examples within the city where the existing associations that have those regulations that have been approved prior to this legislation do have prohibitions or other restrictions that uh, would be in conflict with the this new state legislation. Um, so the state legislation, as I understand it, doesn't require that associations go back and amend uh, those CCNRs uh, to be compliant, uh, but we are obligated to not allow future CCNRs to have these same restrictions. So another example is that uh, some CCNRs prohibit ADUs or accessory dwelling units uh, currently. 
Yeah, um, MC Chris answered that question uh, perfectly with regard to the legislation of House Bill 2001 and its applicability to uh, CCNRs. I would um, go on to answer your question with regard to the different distinction between um, a division or a partition and a subdivision. And in state law, currently in House Bill 2001 did not change any of these um, distinctions. It, a partition of land or what we call a minor partition is three or fewer lots being created. So if you were just subdividing as any particular property owner in the city of Hillsboro and your lot area allowed it, and you were partitioning your single lot into two, that would be a, a land use partition. If you were, let's say you had several acres and you were now trying to create many lots, that would be a subdivision that's four or greater. And so that's the only distinction. So um, we as a city do anticipate that we'll see a few people who may choose to do some dividing. And as um, Leslie mentioned, or Leslie or Chris had uh, described in all the state legislation, and there it was a um, Senate Bill 458, that Senate Bill or House Bill, sorry, I forget sometimes, uh, 458, I know I've got the number correct, is that allows for uh, division of middle housing, uh, which is a unique thing. So if, um, but it's from the parent parcel. And so there's some very unique attributes to that, that I would have to maybe look to Kathy if she's got that in her head, but that gets into the complexities of um, middle housing. If you wanna, we can follow up on that. Thank you. We've had one of our houses was burned down, a totally different issue. And the question is, can they now take these, we have good sized lots, uh, just um, eliminate the house entirely and proceed to build four units there, for example, even though our CC and RSAU cannot subdivide. So that I was trying to get clarity on and we also know that city law overrides uh, um, local HOA law rules because you supersede us. So that's why I was trying to get clarity on, on um, that definition. Can these four units just be built and rented or can they actually be built and sold as single units? But I, you, don't, you don't know the answer probably, so I'll have well, to that. <laughs> I think the answer, and speaking in a theoretical sense of not, yeah. let's say, yeah. um, any homeowner in the city of Hillsborough has a 7,000 square foot lot and staff, if you, or Kathy, if you see it differently, but if you met the minimum lot size standard for a quad uh, plex, the what your example that you're providing, you met the minimum standard for that lot size, which I believe is 7,000 square feet now for that. I need staff to back me up on that. You would, in theory, if let's say the lot was vacant, however it got that way, you could build now under House Bill 2001 provisions of housing Hillsboro, you could build a quadplex, notwithstanding the CCNRs, which is a private contract with your subdivision neighbors and not one as you've correctly identified that we would uh, be as a city getting involved in. Okay, thank you. Yes. And is, am I correct, staff, that it's 7,000 square feet for the quad? Yeah, I'm, nobody's contradicting me, so I think I had it correct. Thanks. And it, MC, it, likely in, in the CCNRs for your association, there's a requirement that each property owner go through some kind of approval process with the HOA prior to doing anything. So that would likely be the step that a property owner in your neighborhood would go through and be reminded of the CCNRs, uh, ideally ahead of submitting an application to the city. But as Colin indicated, uh, you know, the CCNRs are not the city's to regulate. That's not our authority. Uh, so, um, you know, there could be the potential if they came into the city and asked for approval uh, before not even um, being aware of the CCNR process that they're could be a conflict there, but that would become more of a matter within the association to enforce those rules. And yeah, I agree with everything Chris just said. I want to say, MC, um, that um, 
we will answer all, and to everyone here this morning, we'll answer all these questions very directly as they relate to the uh, code, code work we're um, working on, but we're definitely not providing legal advice here. So highly recommend that you speak to others in that area. Thanks. Colin, if I, I could, I, uh, just with regard to the 7,000 square foot lot size for quads, I mean, it does vary by zone. So obviously in our 10 zone, you know, versus, you know, our five. So just so folks should know it's, it's not a flat uh, fixed minimum lot size on that. Thanks. Thank you. You're welcome, MC. All right, Laura, let's shift on to the next person who's got a question. All right, uh, Katie was the next person to raise their hand. Thank you so much, team. I really appreciate uh, you taking the time this morning to explain some of these things to us. Uh, like most residents, I'm, I'm curious how this project will affect my neighborhood. Uh, I've been reading through some of the revisions to the community development code, and certainly, you know, I'm kind of planning on putting together maybe more specific questions in an email. So thanks for dropping that email address in here. Um, wanted to ask in the in the community development code, the zone in which I live, uh, Station Community Residential Orenco Townsite Conservation has a lot of extremely specific planning, building and design standards because it is identified as historic. Uh, so can you address how some of these middle housing allowances will affect zones like this? Thanks for that question, Katie. Leslie, would you want to take that one? Sure. Yeah, it was, it's always a who's going to answer first here. Get in here. Thanks uh, for that question, Katie. And it's a good one. Uh, but the uh, House Bill 2001 does require clear and objective standards, um, even in districts with overlays such as this. So we have worked to put those, uh, you know, design criteria into clear and objective standards. Um, so, and, and make them, um, and with clear and objective, then it's not a, a hearing process or a, a notice process as well. So the process will change and the housing, uh, the details of the design have, have now all become clear and objective. There are options for a, a you know, an adjustment type review as well. So there's a clear and objective path for all of this. And there's also an opportunity if you want to vary from some of those standards to go through uh, what we call a type two or a type three uh, that would get into some of the more subjective uh, approval criteria. Rachel, was there anything that you wanted to add there? Um, no, I don't think so. I think just the the highlight maybe would be that um, the same um, the same process has to apply for single family and middle housing. So um, the a lot of the design standards in Orenco, um, as as they're currently written in the code, some of them aren't as clear and objective as they need to be to uh, meet the requirements. So we have looked at all of those design standards. Um, and the, the proposed changes are aiming to make those design standards very clear and objective. And Richard or Leslie, would one of you mind uh, providing Katie with an example of a, a change and one that comes to mind for me is just the, the change in language from uh, relative to paint colors. If, if you all recall that one, or I, I can... Yeah, I can't remember what the ex existing standard is, but the proposed would be you come in with a four palette paint, um, you know, a palette that includes four different paint colors or material colors. Uh, so that's clear and objective. Do you have four? Uh, then you meet. Um, and I can't, I, I, off the top of my head, yes. I can't remember what it was. Oh, no worries. R Rachel, do you happen to recall? Um, so the standard in Arinko used to be that it um, the, the only prohibition was on using primary paint, primary colors for your paint. Um, so that was the existing standard. Um, yeah, prior to the code change, no, no primary colors. 
Right. I was more thinking we had a reference to, uh, and it might not be the the Aranko. I think it might be more downtown that there was a reference to paint colors, and we are now specifying the palette uh, of paint colors that are available. So instead of staff having discretion when an applicant submits an application to say yes, that meets it, it's it's prescriptive and saying here's the palette that you can pick from. Right. If I might, I could give, I mean, I'm, I, I've got that chapter open in front of me. And so maybe some examples. And again, if, if you're looking at this uh, for, um, and, and it, <laughs> Kate, I, I suspect you probably already have uh, looked at this code section, but I'll, I'll say it just for the benefit of the others in the audience. It's 1262-400. It's the architectural conservation standards specific to the Orenco town site area. And there are some amendments to that, again, primarily trying to make it more clear and objective, but also more specific. So if something were to say, um, you know, that a porch needed to be elevated, we obviously, if it's going to be clear and objective, somebody could come in and say, well, it's only elevated two inches, that counts. Um, so when you make it clear and objective, you also need to be more specific. So for example, it's elevated, the suggested amendment is by at least 24 inches above grade. What do we mean when we say elevated, right? So one needs to be both uh, clear and objective, but also in doing so more specific. Um, and so there are a number of changes do, that do that sort of thing. So you'll see those. Um, and then, yes, I think the wording around the color palette, uh, it used to just say color, building color shall be compatible with the surrounding area and consistent with color char palette characteristics of architectural styles 1890s to 1930s. Um, and now it's referencing a, a any color selected from a historic, the Sherwin Williams historic exterior color wall palette meets this requirement. Paint may be supplied by another manufacturer, of course, that has the same RGB hex value. And I think that's what Chris was thinking of. And so again, in an attempt to preserve the standard, the, the idea behind the standard but do it in a measurable way. And clear objective standards have to be sort of measurable. Any two people applying that standard would reach the same conclusion um, and have that same outcome. So that's that was the solution there to try and preserve the intent of the standard that has, you know, was previously approved, but make it more clear and objective and measurable. I hope that helps explain a little bit. And please do look at those and standards and, and provide feedback on them. Thanks. Thanks, Kathy, Leslie, and Rachel. Katie, did that answer your question? Do you have any follow-ups? Um, I, I, my question is more to do with building standards and not really to do with design standards. So um, I, I'm happy to you know, kind of get a little bit more specific, like I said, in an email to the team, because I know this is something that affects one zone and not a lot of other zones. Yeah, that'd be great, Katie, if you wouldn't mind doing that. And uh, on that project webpage, we've already uploaded uh, what we've seen as some frequently asked questions. So uh, there's a link there. And as we get additional questions, uh, we will be updating that periodically to integrate additional questions. So um, if they're not captured, uh, on those FAQs, uh, we'll, we'll make our best effort, Katie, to respond directly to you um, if it's a specific question that that may be super nuanced and um, get back to you in as timely manner as we can. Thanks. You're welcome. All right, Laura, who is up next? Uh, next with their hand raised is Dirk. All right. Dirk, go ahead when you're ready. We're not hearing you if you're speaking. See, so you're muting and unmuting, Dirk, but we're still not hearing you.
maybe Dirk, if you can log out and log back in, maybe that'll fix it. And we'll just, we'll go to the other raised hand for now. Can you hear me now? Oh, there we go. Yep. That was my mic volume. I'm sorry, guys. Thank you for waiting for me. Uh, so I had a uh, number of questions, you know, as after the last meeting, and I wanted to talk about the eight better minimum standard, not because I'm necessarily opposed to it per se, but um, when I look at the whole code uh, and the changes to the, you know, the greater piece of code that we're working on with emergency shelters, it looks like the eight bedroom minimum is going to push anything over eight bedrooms into a group home designation. Is that correct? Dirk, why don't you, if you've got other related components to the eight bedroom question, why don't you go through them all and then we can respond okay. to it all. Okay. Yeah. So that was question one. Um, and like, why did we do it? I, I don't ever want us to look discriminatory. We've never had, <clears throat> we've never had a maximum bedroom standard that I'm aware of. Um, and as you guys know, there's a nine bedroom, nine bath home going up in a Renko. Um, it doesn't look out of place for a Renko compared to what else has gone in here and having toured the home. Uh, I would prefer to see that than a duplex or a quad on that lot, for instance. So I'm just curious where that code came from. And then part two of the question was, uh, the, the the issue with are we making anything over eight bedrooms group homes and then what does that do to an approval because that becomes a whole set of criteria and then the final question on that uh, on those on that topic was uh, if you have a internal uh, ADU so we have an attached ADU let's say it's two bedrooms does that still leave the door open for the primary home to be eight bedrooms and I'm only thinking of this in the light of many parcels I've looked at where I have to scratch my head and wonder if a large home wouldn't be less impactful to the community that it's going in uh, and still achieve the housing goal that we're seeking. This is all part of the single room occupancy movement, which is uh, economically a force right now because of the reality of housing costs. So, you know, bedroom rentals at 800 to 1,000 uh, in nicer settings are becoming very preferred by a lot of people than you know paying 1700 for a studio in a Renko station or something like that so uh, as much as we want to keep all of our options on the table and encourage housing I just anything that we're doing that would discourage an option I, I was concerned about so that's the list of questions I had on that issue okay thanks for that Dirk Kathy it looks like you've unmuted you want to get us started yeah, yeah, that's such a good question. And it's a really uh, interesting uh, topic because it, this is not out of HB 2001, but in fact, um, House Bill 2583, it was, it was 2021 piece of legislation. It basically said that, um, well, it prohibits the establishment or enforcement of occupancy limits based on familial relationship on residential dwelling units by public bodies, okay? So cities can no longer enforce a, a size limit um, or an occupancy limit based on the relationship. It doesn't say you can't have one at all, but you would have to apply it to family and non-family um, residents equally, right? So the city of Hillsborough's current, so can't, can't enforce it, right? So the city of Hillsborough's current definition of family which is used as kind of a building block to uh, say what's a dwelling unit and then what in fact is household living and then by what is household living, what things that aren't household living, the use category, are group living. It's not necessarily a group home per se, but it's called group living. So that's the structure of the current code. It's all built off of this idea of the definition of family. And the definition of family is, again, not something that is going to be enforceable because of that change. And I'll tell you what the, have it open in front of me. It's uh, the definition of family today says an individual or two or more persons related to one or more persons in the household by blood, marriage, domestic partnership, as defined in the Hillsborough Municipal Code, legal adoption or guardianship, living together in a dwelling unit in which board or lodging may also be provided 
for not more than three additional por uh, persons excluding live-in employees. So obviously that, that is based on familial relationship. And uh, it is diff there is a different rule if those people were unrelated and that's what's no longer allowed. So that taking away that definition then means we have to go in and say, okay, what are the differences between group living and household living? Other jurisdictions in the metro area have solved this by saying, well, let's base it on bedrooms because that's not discriminatory based on familial relationship. Right. So that was the, that's the, it's yes, there, there's probably other ways to set the threshold, right? To say, what's the difference between a group living situation and a household living situation? Assuming that, you know, we want those to be distinct. There are reasons to make them distinct. Not both of them aren't allowed in everywhere in the city. If we can't base the distinction, you could say, well, it's simply any 12 people living together, or and I just made that number up, but any X number of people living together uh, is, a, is a, a household and any more than that is group living. But then again, that has repercussions that are, are equally challenging for large families, for example. So I think you can see the problem that we're, we're faced with uh, as far as um, finding a way to rebuild that the, the distinction between household living and group living uh, without relying on the definition of family. So that's the background story. Does that help? I don't know if that makes sense. Um, kind of uh, the... I guess the other part of that explanation is how do we define a bedroom um, in the real estate community? And I think under appraisal guidelines, bedrooms have to have uh, closets. Um, I don't know if that's changing under the current code, but obviously somebody could construct some kind of floor plan with sleeping rooms. And, you know, our quote unquote family, when we grew up, we're four in a bedroom. So, I mean, I get what you're saying. There's no limit on the number of people, which I think is a great thing. I, I, I've always felt difficult. it's difficult to ever enforce the rules the way they were. So I understand your explanation that having a threshold is helpful because it's non-discriminatory by nature. It's just a bedroom count. Um, do you guys know how we define bedrooms? I think there's the building code has some specific square footage, minimums, an uh, ingre uh, egress window, and some other features. Um, I don't have that open in front of me. Let's okay. see, I bet you know. That's all right. Okay. There are some specific standards, I believe, about clear height ceilings over a certain amount of square footage, et cetera. Uh, maybe staff um, could, can staff take on the question I had about the ADU being either part of or not part of the bedroom count? Yeah, I was just gonna jump in and answer that. Thanks, Rachel. Um, and, and, um, yeah, I did want to, because you specifically asked the bed, the bedroom definition or, or what we define as a bedroom comes from the building code and building makes that determination, um, not planning. Um, but, uh, I'm fairly certain the current building code definition doesn't have anything to do with closets. That's strictly real estate and appraisal um, based. Um, the, uh, code definition limitation on bedrooms is per dwelling unit. So, a uh, house could have eight bedrooms and then could have an attached ADU with also with eight bedrooms. Obviously, uh, realistically, you can't fit eight bedrooms within a 750 square foot uh, space. So you're inherently limited because bedrooms do have size requirements in the building code. Um, but per the definition of dwelling unit, you, you could have up to eight bedrooms and ADUs are considered an accessory dwelling unit. They're not considered a part of the main dwelling unit. So the limitation is for eight in the primary dwelling and then eight in the ADU, which obviously is, is space limited. <clears throat> Thank you, Rachel. All right, Dirk, so it looks like we covered that question. Um, you're very welcome to ask others. We, we do have one other attendee with their hand raised. So um, if you have others, uh, Let's... You know, I always have more. I'll, I'll tell you what, I'm going to have to go pretty soon. So I'm going to ask just a couple more if that's okay with you guys. Sure. And I'll try to make go it for quick. It. Yep. Um, 
the cottage cluster, did I see that the minimum size of a cottage cluster unit is a thousand square feet? Max, max uh, for a cottage in a cottage cluster is 900 square feet, and that doesn't include 200. Actually, it's a little bit more complicated than even mm. that. So there's a, there's a, there's a footprint minimum or maximum, which is the 900 square feet. That comes out of HP 2001. Okay. So there's a, there's a limit on the footprint. Um, then what, in order to both limit the maximum size of a cottage, as well as encourage a variation in the sizes within a cluster, there are two other standards that relate. So there's a maximum size of each cottage, and I want to think it is 1,400 square feet. So no cottage can be larger than that. And right. the cluster, the average a maximum. So if you took all of the cottages together and you had some that were very small, say 400, you could have others that were larger. The average maximum is a thousand square feet. So as I recall, and I, again, I should let me turn to that code section real quick and just make sure I'm telling you the right numbers. But it is complicated and it's there's a real good reason behind that. I mean, obviously footprint only tells you part of the story. If you want to encourage a variation in sizes, you need the average is what's doing that, right? Because it's it's saying, oh, it's fine to have some larger units if you also have some smaller units. And that was something that was seen as desirable because it gives you a variety of you know, price points and, and housing types that are suitable. Also, hopefully maybe leads to some that would just be smaller single story units and uh, not all of them being um, two story. So uh, that, that is the, that's the, the uh, background. Well, was there a minimum? I think I saw a minimum size and I, I'm interested in small units versus large units. I think cottage clusters at a thousand feet per unit are a pretty aggressive size. Um, I've yep. seen some great work in the four to 600 square foot range where yeah. you can keep affordability down. I don't, I don't believe, I mean, I'm, I, I'm not sure where you saw the minimum. Um, I don't yeah. think there is one, okay. but if you could, if, if something's been miswritten so that it implies that you have to have a minimum of a thousand, oh, yeah. that would be an error. And you please let us know that because that, that's not the intention. I will. Thank you. Okay, yeah. Um, thanks. Yeah. Sometimes these um, things, like in getting written, if it, especially if it's not clear and it looks like it's intended as a minimum, then we want to fix that. Okay, thank you for that, Owen. Um, <clears throat> my uh, <clears throat> other, I had a couple other questions, but um, probably the most substantive one that I had a, a concern about was, um, you know, the parking standards, the way I look at this, we just talked about an eight bedroom house. So um, the current standards require one parking space for an eight bedroom home, right? And they're gonna require one parking space for a cottage cluster. So that discussion we just had, both of my first two questions, eight bedroom home can now have an unlimited number of people living in it, I guess. So let's just say an eight bedroom home has uh, 12 people and seven cars. It's only required to have one parking stall, right? Um, the way I view the code. Um, then that cottage cluster at 450 square feet unlikely it'll have more than two, it still has one. So the threshold for parking to me seems unfair, and I'm not sure if that's anything that can be done in the code, but just an anecdotal comment I wanted to make because I see the potential for overflow parking, you know, pouring into communities where larger units are built versus cottage clusters, and maybe some discussion needs to be had around that. Um, am I, if staff can correct me, am I wrong in that statement or is that correct? That you're correct, Dirk. A single family dwelling has uh, one off site parking requirement, and the other middle housing has one per dwelling unit. Okay. And I, is, that, is there anything that could be done about that? Is there a discussion that could be had about, about that, or is that kind of hands off because we can't presume people drive? Well, there's, there's nothing that, as far as the minimum required for a single family detached unit, um, I think that is not something that's open to change at this point within the Metro okay. region. Paul, is that correct? 
I don't know. I'm so, sorry, Kathy. Can you repeat that? I didn't hear you. Yeah, I, I, the, the the fact that there's only one space required for a single family detached dwelling is uh, not. I think that's not subject to change at this point for the city because of Metro's requirements. Is that the case? Well, yeah, I'd have to go back and look at Metro. I, I, um, I think the Metro code, I don't know if it requires it, but certainly permits um, the single space and, and maybe it requires. So I'll go back and look at that. Um, Dirk, the answer is that this is a conversation that was had by our uh, project advisory committee, which is uh, also the planning commission. And they had a robust conversation around this subject. And uh, recently at a work session, they had this conversation again. So it's one that is um, been discussed. The uh, consensus out of the project advisory committee was to appreciate that HB 2001 is a big step in change yeah. of our community to start with and to um, not require off-site or off-street parking could impact livability of the community in ways that, you know, is just maybe going to magnify the change that's already going to be brought by HB 2001. And so I'm not, you know, I'm trying to make sure you don't think I'm making a statement, but that was the consensus that they came from. And so that policy is still being discussed by our planning yeah. commission through the work sessions. Okay. I can understand that. We don't want to restrict things when we're trying to make things easier and we also don't know, none of us know what the adoption of any of this is going to be. You know, history would tell us that adoption, even in Portland and in Tigard, who's had these rules since, you know, 2016 or 17, hasn't been that great. It's just back to the question of whether an HOA will allow it, you know, unlikely in a lot of HOAs will allow any of this. And that, that takes up a great portion of our city in modern times because those HOAs are boilerplate. And, and I think that's a legal matter that has to be struggled with. Uh, I'd like to close my uh, questions out and thanks for giving me so much platform guys. I really appreciate it. Um, so I think Leslie or Rachel will remember I came in for a pre app on the corner of Walnut and fourth street. Um, and there was this discussion about doing up to 16 units there under the existing code. Uh, didn't want to do that. I wanted to do a cottage cluster. We couldn't get there because I couldn't, um, I just couldn't, uh, the code didn't support what we were trying to do. Uh, we still have that property. The issue with that property was two lots of record. Um, power lines on the Walnut side had 14, have 14 wires there. I now have my bids back at over 160,000 to bury those power lines for me to do any development. Okay, so I've, I've fallen back to no development at all, no infill in a great part of Hillsborough for infill. So I'm hoping for these rules to allow me to approach that as either a quad, uh, keep the existing home with maybe two additional units on its tax lot, um, and then do a quad or cottage cluster on the other one. Um, so this gets into the threshold under where will we have, what will the clear and objective standards be for anything beyond a duplex on lots of record, for instance, over there though, and is the, is our policy as a city that requires the landowner to pay, in that case, 125% of the cost, um, with total, it was 160,000, right? So that, that killed that project and it's sitting, it's sitting there today. Will I be able to do a duplex, triplex or quad without having to bury those power lines? I currently don't have to for a single family on that lot. So this gets back to how we treat missing middle housing types versus uh, sing, our current single family zone. Uh, this means a lot to me on that property and it means a lot to people with infill because when you're unfortunate enough to have that power line or if you don't have a storm line or no sewer or things like that, it really kills these options. So um, where will our threshold be and where will we, where will we not uh, allow for our single family um, uh, requirements to to uh, be used when we're looking at missing middle. So I'll start with the response, Derek, and then turn it over to Leslie. So the main point of your question is related to the utility undergrounding requirements and the costs associated with that. And that yep. is, you know, a, as you indicated, a critical component to, you know, the delivery of, of the housing projects that, that you're working on. 
the improvements associated with middle housing staff is still working through that uh, internally as well as with partner agencies like clean water services um, you know we're all trying to get on the same page in a very quick time frame uh, relative to dedications frontage improvements and the like for middle housing and being mindful of reducing barriers so you know there's still work for us to do in in that sense also um not necessarily concurrent but uh we have engaged um in a process where we are revisiting the utility undergrounding requirements and yeah. leslie maybe if you can touch on that uh, so that dirk's aware of that as well as others thanks chris <laughs> yeah thanks chris uh yeah, we've got the go ahead to move forward with looking at that uh, utility undergrounding requirement, Dirk, and um, looking for options to make it clear for planning staff as well as applicants to understand when uh, undergrounder would be required and, you know, perhaps look at more equitable options, uh, include fee and lieu one, as one of them, but also looking at options, you know, uh, based on development size or location or making a, a, a map of priority areas. So uh, that will be um, moving forward this year uh, for the utility undergrounding. I don't remember uh, in this code what, what our draft code says right now on, on the development standards. As Chris said, we're still working through those and what the trigger points are. So I can't answer, uh, answer that directly right now. Okay, well, I know, I, I know I've been told I can build a home there with an ADU without facing that cost. That's also in the down, Hillsborough Downtown Urban Renewal District, and the Urban Renewal document from 2010 specifically talks about uh, having money and programs to um, maybe work around issues like that. If I'm not mistaken, I think the apartments at the corner of 3rd and Lincoln were just given a waiver uh, or a variance to not have to bury what was in front of them. I might be wrong, but I'm aware that people could ask for a variance. I just see you know, this is where you see one side of the street heavily burdened, the other side doesn't have it. And I'm always about equitable treatment of, of people and their options. And to have one side be so heavily burdened, this didn't used to cost very much. You guys know that. It used to be a reasonably, PG and others used to be reasonable to work with, but the more wires we're putting up, the more difficult it is. And it's, uh, if it was 20,000, it'd be one thing, but, um, and it also something that benefits the entire community, putting those lines underground in the future is designed to benefit the whole community, but to burden one parcel, I'm sure that's the, um, you know, that's the substance you guys have been talking about. So I hope we can get there because I'd hate to have these incredible opportunities and then have so many properties cut off from them by infrastructure uh, requirements. So uh, again, thank you for all the time. I'll continue to stay involved and in everything you're doing is very helpful. Great to see people getting involved. So thanks again. Thanks for your time, Dirk. Yep. Take care. All right. Laura, looks like we have one more hand raised. Yep. I'll bring them in. Hello. <clears throat> hey, a quick question. To summarize uh, what are the discussion on the bedroom count, uh, you were saying it's no more uh, limited on the size of the uh, number of people staying in the household it's you're just limiting the number of rooms to be eight and is that applicable for the single family housing only or uh, missing middle house and uh, my second question is on on the slide that you presented the topic there was a comment about expert process for the large division what does that mean if you could elaborate those two that would be great all right roger yeah, well, uh, so it seemed like a two part question where the first was on the bedroom count and uh, whether or not that only applies to single detached dwellings. And then uh, you're asking for more specifics on the expedited middle housing land division. So, Kathy, would you mind touching on the applicability of the eight bedroom standard uh, for um, housing units? Yeah, uh, that's per dwelling unit. So anything that's a dwelling unit, whether it's a, and so a dwelling unit is basically, it could be a single family house, it could be one of the units in a duplex or a triplex or fourplex, any one of those units, each one's a, a dwelling unit. 
uh, a, a, an accessory dwelling unit is also a dwelling unit. So uh, that limit is per dwelling unit, the way it's written now. Thanks. And Ken. the other question, oh, go ahead, Chris. No, Please. it's okay. You go ahead. Well, I, I, I wanted to just a quick recap on the second part on the second question about um, expedited land divisions. And could, Roger, could you repeat that part for me? So I make sure I understand the question. So what, what does that actually mean? That's what I was trying to understand. I'm not too familiar. What does that expedite mean? So, oh, go so ahead. I think Raj is just asking for an explanation on what is an expedited middle housing land division, probably relative to our current code standards on land divisions. Ah, okay. Well, that, that makes sense. Um, yeah, it's so uh, there, there is this, something that's been on the books for a long time per state law called an expedited land division. And the city's code had a reference to it which basically just pointed to the Oregon revised statute rules. So the code amendments to make it easier for people that wanted to apply for an expedited land division, one of the changes is to bring some of those regulations into the development code itself. So that was one of the changes that you're gonna see. The other thing that happened is new legislation, um, which was SB 458, uh, said that when, and this was a companion piece of legislation to go with HB 2001, and sorry for all of these different citations, um, but that's for middle housing specifically. So for middle housing, it said, okay, if you've developed middle housing, say you've developed a cottage cluster, and you uh, now want to sell the cottages on each on their own lot, we're going to require that cities allow that. And here's some very specific rules about how that be allowed. This is what cities can and can't do in what we call a middle housing land division. The other thing that the legislature said was when cities go through that process, they have to follow the same procedure as an expedited land division. And so what you see in the new code standards are uh, if you look at those, you'll see expedited land divisions, you'll see middle housing land divisions. Again, expedited land divisions, that's been something that's been available for a relatively, it's not very popular because it's a relatively narrow set of things that can qualify under state law for that. And then there's middle housing land divisions, that's new. It's probably gonna make those procedures a lot more popular because it's gonna be, more things are gonna qualify. Uh, so that's in there as well. Those have different process times and review cycles compared to a standard partition or subdivision. So land divisions, anytime you're dividing a land, you know, it can be through a subdivision, it can be through a partition, it can be through an expedited land division, it can be through a middle housing land division. So lots of, lots of acronyms and terminology on this, apologies for that. It, it's a complicated bit of state law that we're trying to implement. I'd jump in there and just give some of those timelines uh, and a regular partition, regular kind of land use decisions. There's a 30 day city review for completeness. You know, is this application complete? I think with expedited, it goes from 30 days to 21 days. And uh, once an application is complete, the city has in a regular process, 120 days to make a decision that goes to 63 in expedited, but it's limited. Those opportunities are limited. I think it, to certain properties and maybe they can't have uh, resource land on them, something like that. So uh, just some basics there. And if I have a house uh, with a vacant land uh, and that meets the requirement of a uh, duplex or quadplex. Do I have to divide the lot or I don't have to divide the lot? Um, one more time with the question, I'm sorry. So if, if you, in my understanding, if you had a house and you built and you converted it to, I'd say a duplex or- a No, 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 you, oh. sorry, no, I'll repeat it. If I, I have a house, single family house and there's mm -hmm. big enough vacant land in the property, Mm -hmm. 
if we want to have a quad or duplex or triplex on the property, do I have to divide the lot or can I just build as it is? Oh, uh, yes. So you could, if you had enough land, uh, you could add um, a duplex, triplex, cottage cluster, uh, potentially, well, you know, it's complicated because uh, cottage cluster would be the one that actually makes sense in that circumstance because it takes into account the uh, existence of your current house as a part of the cottage cluster. The duplex, triplex, fourplex would be a conversion of your existing house into that through an addition or something like that because otherwise you'd have a detached uh, quadplex, for example, which isn't is something that the code envisions. However, again, if you had your existing house, you put a cottage cluster in behind it, so you kept the house, you put in cottages behind it on that vacant land, you could then through a middle housing land division, the idea is that you could then potentially divide that into individual lots and sell those cottages. Uh, does that but, Yeah, that, 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 that helps, but I guess uh, if we want to do a uh, duplex, for example, and if there's enough sufficient land available, my only path would be to subdivide the lot or partition, I'm not sure the difference exactly. Divide the lot and then build separately. Yeah. That's I think the, Rachel's got her, Rachel, okay. she's unmuted. Go ahead, oh, Rachel. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, I I just wanted to um, highlight too in, in some of the questions that you've asked Raja, um, particularly kind of going back to the bedroom count question. And, and one of the things you said was that essentially a house, detached house or a dwelling unit could have unlimited number of people living in it. And I just wanted to say, because I don't think any of the other questions highlighted this, that um, while the planning code does not limit some of these things anymore, um, these projects are all still subject to building code requirements and fire and life safety requirements. So. Um, a lot of the things that seem uh, that are they're permitted in the planning code and are possible um, may have limitations based on your your lot, um, like things like fire access or any fire and life safety component. So, for example, while our planning code will no longer limit the number of people living in a detached dwelling, it limits bedrooms. Um, the building code does have occupancy limits, um, and that that still will have to be complied with. So um, just wanted to clarify that. And then, um, you know, for things like um, partitioning your lot uh, and building additional units, yes, in theory, that could be permitted if you're meeting things like the minimum lot sizes um, in the zone that you live in, but things like fire and life safety um, and fire access and, you know, any of those things that apply today still will apply after the middle housing uh, bill is passed and after the code changes are made. So um, the feasibility of some of those things is still dependent on uh, restrictions that are that are related to fire and life safety and, and adequate access and things like that. Um, so it's, it's, it's possible, um, but could have constraints based on how your lot is situated in a block, how it's shaped, um, you know, how wide it is, is there going to be enough space for um, like a flag lot, for example, um, some of those, those restrictions are still going to apply and, and the, ne the necessity for frontage, um, things like that will still apply um, if it's not a middle housing land division, which is a little different. Um, but uh, yeah, so it's a possibility that if you have a single family lot or a single detached lot currently, and you have space to partition it, that you could partition it and get additional density back there, but um, in your backyard essentially, but those fire and life safety and um, other considerations like building code, things like that will still apply. Okay, thank you. And I, I just wanted to add, because I think I heard something different in your questions, Raja, that if you wanted to add additional units, you do not have to partition the lot. It could remain as one lot with those additional units. So oh, for duplex? part of your, right. Yeah, duplex, you could have oh. two, three or four, a quad without dividing. Um, Assuming oh. you can fit things, all the necessary parking and 
you know, the fire yeah, yeah. safety things. Yeah. I, I, I misunderstood it. I thought if I have a single family house with, uh, uh, I actually have a house on Jackson School, it's a, almost like a quarter of acre land. I had a single family house, there is like 10,000 square feet I could split. That's it, which, which meets the division requirement. I thought you mentioned I couldn't build a duplex uh, with the vacant land, uh, um, I have to subdivide. Isn't that accurate? If I already have a single family to. house? I do not have to. Oh, okay, thank you. Right. I think you would have to because that's actually that's a mix a mixture of two different housing types. Yeah. Yeah. So I think if you if you have a duplex and you want to build an additional duplex, you, you could do that because that's uh, those are those are the same housing types. Those are both permitted. But if you have a single detached dwelling, your options for additional density are ADUs or cottage cluster under this code without okay. partitioning. Okay, makes sense. Then for duplex, my only option is to divide. If I have if a single have family house, got it. No, yeah, okay, thanks. Exactly. And, and Rachel, actually, you, you touched on something else uh, in the beginning of your uh, explanation about the room size and something like, like that. You said the code doesn't uh, uh, add any restrictions, but uh, who is this? Fire safety or planning? Someone else would add, have, may have some restrictions. What does it mean? Yeah, so I was just referring to the, the fact that, and I'm not a building code expert, but the building code generally does have occupancy limits on any building, um, and that includes single dwellings. Um, over a certain number of people living in a single dwelling, it, it kind of elevates essentially the category of home. It, they have additional limitations or additional code requirements around what are called congregate living facilities. And then beyond that, it becomes a commercial building instead of a single dwelling or residential dwelling. So again, I'm not the expert on that. I'm not a, a building code expert, but I did just wanna highlight that while the planning code will no longer have occupancy restrictions based on number of people um, in, in d residential dwellings, um, the building code does have those restrictions. And I would encourage you if you have a larger house and you're intending to have, you know, a, a lot of occupants in it to check in with the building division because those requirements and occupancy limits, uh, which change which kind of, of house you have in the building code will apply. This process is only removing barriers to middle housing in the uh, development code. It does not, it is not affecting other codes that might apply. everybody for the responses on that. Raja, did you have any other questions? We are not hearing you, Raja, if you're speaking. Oh, sorry, sorry. Um, thanks for explaining. My, my only question is uh, that building code or building department you mentioned, where do they exist actually? So I'm very new to this, so, so I was trying to understand where are they? So if you want to go talk to someone, get more details in the building department, are they in the city? Yeah, uh, city of Pittsburgh, the building itself. Yes, Roger. We have a a division uh, that's within the same department as planning, uh, the building division, and um, you can ask questions to them directly about building code requirements. And they have. Thank you. On the city's web page, uh, there's a, a web uh, on the city's website. There's a web page dedicated to the building division where you can find their contact info. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Great questions. All right, Laura. It looks like that was the last person with their hand up. So just do one more call and see if there's anybody else that has any other questions for the group this morning. All right. Did anybody from staff or Kathy have anything else to add before we wrap up today? Um, no, just to highlight that if you do have specific questions, um, we would love to answer them via email. And uh, our project email was on the screen before, but if you didn't see it, it's middlehousing at hillsborough-oregon.gov. I'll just put that back up real fast, Rachel, that's a good idea. 
And I think it was mentioned earlier, but if you haven't checked out that um, frequently asked questions document, there is some, some good information in there based on other frequently asked questions we've been receiving about the project. So definitely check that out and we'll be updating it with information after this meeting as well from questions that we received here. All right. Thanks for those that attended this morning's session. We do appreciate the energy and the time dedicated and the questions that were asked. It uh, helps us navigate this and understanding where the community has questions. So do appreciate that time. Also appreciate Victor and Rosie being with us for translate. Oh, looks like a hand just got raised. Two, oh, two hands up. All right, Laura, would you mind bringing them in? Yep. Quick question. Is this recording going to be available somewhere? I'm sorry, could you repeat that? Is the session is recording? The session recording? I think the question was asking if the session is recorded. Correct. Oh, yes. The session is recorded. I don't... It's recording available. And I think we're posting yeah. it to our website. Are we not? Rachel would be best able to answer that. Um, I haven't confirmed that we're able to post the recording. The PowerPoint will, is available already on the website. Um, the PDF of the PowerPoint is available, um, but I'm not sure if we're able to get the recording up. Um, but we will, we will follow up on that. And um, uh, Roger, I, believe, I, I have your contact information, so I can let you know if we're able to do that. The Colin Militich has been helping to put the recording, getting the link up via YouTube. So that will be on our website if it's not already, at least from the last community meeting. Perfect. There you go. All right. So it looks like MC also has a hand raised. Last question. Just got to confirm from what I just understood that I'm living in an SFR 10 zone, all single family houses. Um, and so if for anyone here in this zone with a single family house on the lot already, the only choices for adding more units would be either an ADU or cottage cluster, which is too big for our space. So really in our zone 10, we can only add basically ADUs to increase housing. Can, can I clarify that um, a little sure. bit? Oh, yeah, so there's also, I mean, obviously internal conversions of existing dwelling units would be, have, are allowed, have to be allowed um, per HB 2001. And I think we need to, as a group, just, it sounds like, um, in fact, I was I was going to just about to send an email, just to make sure we're all clear on the regulations um, as they would apply to the example that I think Raja was describing, which is you have an existing single family house, you have plenty of land. Do you have to subdivide or partition to put a different housing type, for example, a duplex or a triplex behind that existing single family house? if you don't wanna say do an internal conversion of your house. And I think that we need to make sure that the code amendments are clear on that point. Um, and so that's something um, that I think we wanna do. And, and, and so we'll be, that's, it was a great question. It's been a, and your follow-up question is really helpful as well, highlights an area that we need to clarify. So um, we'll, be, we'll be confirming that. Um, but the cottage cluster um, specifically envisions somebody being able to keep their existing single family house is as a part of the cottage cluster itself and describes kind of how that might happen and provides some exceptions to the size limits on cottages so that that existing house can stay. So it's, it's specifically describing how that might work. The other housing, the duplex, triplex housing types, for example, don't say that. So they don't have anything specific other than the idea of a conversion. So, and, and, and allowing additions to that house to allow for that conversion. So uh, more to follow on that, but uh, does that help answer the question? It, it helps to refine the reframing of it, yes. So, <laughs> so I'm looking for more answers, I guess, is the, uh, is the answer.
and and I hope that will be one of the FAQs. Might not be asked by many, but certainly it's is relevant to yeah, lots of yeah. us in SFR ten zones. Right, right. So great question. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thanks to all of you. I really appreciate your help on this. You're welcome. Thanks for joining us, and yeah, we will definitely. Uh, include that in the FAQs. As Kathy indicated, it's important to make that distinction clear uh, for all of us. All right. Well, it looks like that was the last question for this morning. So thanks again to everybody. And we'll stop the recording and then we'll get uh, the PowerPoint and uh, the recording up and available on the city's webpage.